top and to fill, fill out the same information on each. Uh, all right? So I'm saying 10 reminders to be given each sitter. There you go. So my wife is the sitter. She's not the babysitter. She's the church sitter, okay? So get a hold of my wife if you're going to be a part of the pack of pew thing, all right? Christ's disciples were hands-on, weren't they? Amen. You guys think Christ's disciples were hands-on? Yes, sir. You think they spent a lot of time sitting in a church or a lot more time out in the street? Okay, so little hands, big hearts is the children's discipleship ministry that we're starting right now. And there are probably 40 of you that are involved in that right off the bat. It's a child is known by his doings is the central text, okay? Be thou Christ's disciples. Be, be thou an example of the believers in word and deed. Christ's disciples were hands-on. And so we're going to be doing this. We're teaching our kids. You just saw them all. There's a bunch of them that just left. And some that were here for Sunday school and had to go. Pray for Lionel and Sarah. They have a funeral this morning. And they do bring half our Sunday schoolers, like 11 of them. So pray for them as they weren't able to make it this morning. But uh, all the children's and the teens start in the service like we did this morning. But then this evening, you'll see them go. You'll see these Christ disciple followers actually taking part of the time. They're going to be meditating on Scripture, memorizing Scripture, evangelizing, learning to serve, learning to clean, learning to serve others in the cooking, in the breakfasts. I already saw some kids out doing some things this morning. And so keep them in your prayers as they continue forward. And if you want to be a part of that program, this is the reason for the announcement. Please talk to my wife. Talk to Tom. Talk to the Horsemans. Talk to any of the Sharps, I think, are also a part of that. They talked about it on Wednesday night. So be a, be a part of it. And they'll get you to the proper people, the corresponding people. Let's start spending time each service just praying for this revival as well. You know, we had 30 days. I think we've got like 18 now is all. 18 or so left. 17. And this is two weeks right here, isn't it? Is this a two-week mark? I think it is. So including today, I think it's only 15 days until the revival time. Why don't you come, my friends, if you will, and get on your knees. Any of you would, well, would come around, and we're just going to pray for the revival this morning, if you will. Lord, I thank you for a church that understands the difference between this needs to be done, let's do it, versus let me pray about what God's will for me is. Lord, if things need to be done, your word says that we're the church. You've already given us the command. We need to stop debating whether or not to do it. If we're gifted in an area, we need to use our gifts. I just pray, dear Lord God, that as revival fires start, that we would catch that principle and understand we don't need to pray about your will. It's already evident in the scripture what your will is. We are to be evangelists. We don't need to pray about evangelizing. We are to be an active part of your church. We don't need to pray about exercising our gifts. This morning's message, O oh precious Lord, I pray, would be clear to people that we don't do that. From Ephesians chapter 4, he tells us very clearly the gifts have already been given. They are to be exercised. We've been commanded to exercise our gifts. And if we have those gifts, Lord, may we do it in the way that you prescribe most certainly. Father, we pray for people who will come and learn to do that. That they won't just get saved. That they won't just be discipled. That they won't just get baptized. But that they will put feet to their words. That they will put action behind their words. I pray that we would put action behind the words of getting people here. Dear Lord God, our hearts are stirred for the needs around us. I just pray that you'll be with every single service, every single moment together, everything that we can do to serve you. Let us get activated. Help us to stop sitting, sitting, sitting. God, forgive us for that. Help us to get up and get going. Lord, this is not about any church or person. This is about serving the precious Lord Jesus Christ. And if we don't understand that, I know you're going to call us on the carpet about it. I'd ask you, Father God, to do it sooner than later. If you need to discipline your children, do it. To help them to understand that sitting around and waiting for whatever isn't right. It is time to do the work now. 
Help us, Father, to fill this building. Help us to pack a pew. Help us to think about how we can be active. Help us to find ways. And if we don't know what to do, Lord, please allow us that privilege and honor to go to our pastoral staff who are set here for that purpose and ask them what needs to be done so that we might do it. And may you be glorified in that as we continue to pray for this revival time. Lord, revival is not for necessarily the unsaved, although we want to see unsaved people saved. Revival is to see Christians activated like they're supposed to be. And God, may you help me to convince your people, may your word do the work through my mouth so that you can use me as an instrument of convin convin convincing. Lord, our prayer is that the Holy Spirit does that conviction through your people. That we would encourage one another to get up off our backsides and actually do for you. Not let a day go by that we serve ourselves and play. God, help us to understand that was never your purpose. Help us to do your work in your way and to love you in your way. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Speaking of, i got to tell you... Uh, my son gave me some bad news, and I just forgot about it, you know. The red team did win this trophy. Those of you who are red, yes, you can clap. Go ahead, go ahead if you want to. So, Tom, I don't know what you did to do that. I think you erased names. You probably crossed through names. Don't you think, Patty? Don't you think you crossed through names, Sabra? Yeah. I think we ought to recount. You guys think we ought to do a recount? You know what was weird? It was, what, a couple of weeks ago. He said, you know, we never did give out that trophy. The red team won. We did win. And that's what I'm basing this on. But you know what? I don't know if Tom is a liar. What do you think? You guys think he's lying? <laughs> But there is a reason that I highlighted that today particularly because we're starting a series in the month of April on the church. I'm going to talk some about that in just a little bit. I also want you to know that in spring and in the summer here, our associate pastors are going to be taking different parts. Now, I know, I get this. A lot of you always kind of say, man, you know, we hired you to preach. i got to take a break once in a while, right? My head is like not right, okay? So we got to allow them to get into the pulpit now, and then we're going to do at least three times a month that each of our associate pastors get involved. We also have one time on May the 26th for the picnic time, for the memorial, that uh, three of our young men are going to preach, and one that really excites me. Well, there's a couple that really do. Nick Sharp, I'm really excited about hearing from him, and Christopher Galletto, who, man, a year ago came to Christ, but I want to hear, of course... We'll review it because of the false doctrine that I know both of them have. So, And then the third guy, I can't remember who he is. <laughs> I honestly can't. But we decided on three guys. Do you remember who it was? Isaac Valdez, of course. And I, I wouldn't think of him because he's not here today. By the way, pray for Isaac. He's in the hospital this morning. Isaac has pneumonia, all right? And so you really need to pray for him. We've been in contact with he and Jasmine, the family. As a matter of fact, Julia has been contacting me several times and texting and calling and just praying for prayers for uh, Isaac right now. And I just pray for the whole Valdez family. They're in the moments of transition right now. And uh, you just pray about how that will all work out. I, I love being able to be close to them and enjoy their fellowship, but we really need to be praying for them and some of the decisions that they have to make here in the future. There's a yard sale. When is that? Is it this Saturday? 8 a.m. at Robin and Dennis's house, correct? Right here close. If you wonder where the address is, you go ahead and get that. And that's for a yard sale for the youth, okay? And also, I wanted you to know that this Friday, there is a round robin soccer tournament going on here at church. Probably will involve a lot of people outside of church as well, which is good because we want to see them coming into church, correct? So you pray about the round robin soccer thing. Do you want to say something about that, times and all of that? Or it's just in the bulletin, 4 o'clock. It's 4 o'clock, all the youth, all that. You say, well, is that just for kids? It's not, is it? The adults can come. They can be a part of that too, right? Or they just, we at least can observe, right? 
Can we touch the ball? Can we touch the ball? <laughs> but we'll have a good time, I'm sure. It's for the youth. I'm sure he wants to keep it for the youth, and that's cool. That's how I think that is, right? Is that why you pause? It's for okay, it's for everybody. Okay. Okay. We have 32 that now have planned visits for revival. Pray about that. And why don't you just stay right where you're at? I'm going to sing a song to you. Uh, this is my turn to do the special music. Just pray that the Lord will use this piece of music in your lives and hearts. Kingdom about to rescue 
16 and verse 33 gives us an introduction to something I think is vital for every Christian. And it's first to make us aware <laughs> that God doesn't confuse. You know, I think we've got the idea that God is playing sort of a cosmic game of chess. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There's a whole bunch of people, we have a lot of people out, even believers, that are saying, you know, God's just mean. He's playing this cosmic game of chess. Our God doesn't do things to test in the sense of putting you in derision for no reason. In fact, James says this. James tells us that God is not tempted with evil. Neither tempted he anyway, anyway. And I think our problem is that we forget who the real accuser is. 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33 tells us who the real accuser is. Well, God's just judging me. He's accusing me. God is not that little G God. Amen. The real little G God, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Amen. As in all churches of the saints, and I love that he uses plural here. I love the Bible's exactitude. I love the way that the Lord works. I tell you, just a little while, for a phrase, for a word, for even a letter in the Bible, entire new, listen to this, cults have been formed. Oh, yeah. Because of what, Pastor? Because of even one tiny letter. <laughs> because of one tiny letter, entire new cults have been formed. We feel lost in the world sometimes, don't we? How many of you are with me on that? You kind of feel lost. This is, nobody believes like I do. Nobody thinks like I do. I don't understand why this world is so... Do you, do you see the craziness in this world? People lying to themselves to make themselves feel better about themselves. And everybody knows, even they know they're lying. But they have forced themselves to believe certain things. Do you feel lost? Let me ask you that. Do you feel lost in the world of religion? How many of you feel lost in the world of religion? You think, man, I don't know what I am. You know? And people even refuse to call themselves Christians anymore. People have gone and say, well, I just believe the Bible. Well, that's a great thing, but how can you regain your authentic identity as a local church? How can you regain your authentic identity as a local church? You see what, Pastor? Did you guys read this sign when you came in? Yeah. Okay, it was the first Baptist church established in the Seaford. Amen. It's the first one. You say, Pastor, well, I'm not a Baptist. Well, you're sitting at Baptist church. Yeah. And this is a Baptist church. Mm -hmm. And this is a Baptist church without apology. Amen. Now, I understand very well there are a lot of Baptists that have done bad things. There's a lot of religions that have done bad things. And we're not trying to not auto-correct. You know what I'm saying? We need to correct ourselves. But I want to go through in the next month on a series on the local church. Amen. And what it is that the local church really is. And how... off, so confused, so much junk going on, is because Satan is confusing people. I want you to remember a fact for me, okay? Those of you who are no, new, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not scared. And this is the way we just do, okay? But Amen. I'm going to come down here and just say this. 99.5% of rat poison is good food. And you know what it does to the rats? It kills them. 99.5% of religious mumbo jumbo is pretty good food. It's the 0.5% that will kill your spirituality. That's right. It will kill you as a believer. It will destroy your life. Again, 
I want you to know that an entire cult, an entire false cult, was created because of one letter that was misplaced. You say, Pastor, what was it? I'll tell you about it in just a minute. We're going to talk about several false religions today, but I want you to know this, that any banker doesn't learn about false bills, that doesn't learn about counterfeit bills by studying counterfeit bills. Because there are just too many counterfeit bills. Mm -hmm. As far as religion is concerned, I don't need to study the 7,000 plus religions that indeed exist right now. I don't need to study them. What a banker does is he studies the authentic note. Yep. And so study your Bible. Like Amen. Never before. Put your nose in the book, know the word, and when something comes wrong, along, it goes, oh, that really smells. Well, that's, wow. That, oh, yeah, it is really. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great perfume, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Great clothes. <laughs> but you'll know <laughs> that something smells in Denmark <laughs> if it be that you studied the authentic Word of God. Now you're in Ephesians chapter 4, I imagine, because you already saw that coming. Go to Ephesians chapter 4, if you will, my friend. He starts in verse 1. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. That you walk what? Worthy. How do you do that? Walk worthy of what? Vocation. Well, here's the problem. Today, we have the idea that we're on perpetual vacation rather than vocation. Mm -hmm. Christians everywhere are on perpetual vacation mm -hmm. rather than on their vocation. Yeah. So the question yesterday is, what did you do in the vocation of Christ? Come on. Amen. Hey, you're paying really good attention today. I appreciate that. <laughs> what did you do yesterday in line of the vocation of Christ? No, yesterday I spent time with my family. That's sad. I'm sorry. Every day ought to be the vocation of Christ. No, no, Pastor. We all get one day off. Every Jesus didn't take a day off. Jesus Christ healed on the Sabbath. Nope. Jesus Christ ministered on the Sabbath. Right. Jesus Christ did well on the Sabbath. And the question for you is very simply, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, are you a Christian? Or does that just happen on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock? Mm. You know, evangelism isn't Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Evangelism isn't Tuesday and Thursday at 4 o'clock. Evangelism isn't Saturday. You just said those times were the times. No, I didn't. I said those are possible times. <laughs> you go with us. That's right. You know, yeah. Saturday night, you go with these guys. But 24 7, you're a Christian, Michael, right? 24 yeah. 7, I ought to be in the vocation of the Lord. Yeah. So, well, I'm taking a break from that. That's sad. That's sad. I'm very sorry for you. You know, if you were a prisoner of the Lord, mm. that's good. Yeah. You're not, though, are you? And you say, I'm not a prisoner. I'm an American. That's just the problem. You've imprisoned yourself to being an American. Mm -hmm. And that has ruined your whole life. Because Americans believe that a 45-minute experience on Sunday morning is religion. Right. Yeah. Pastor, you're hitting too many buttons here. I'm going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to beseech you with Paul to walk worthy of the vocation where with your call when your pastor says hey why don't you go with us to do this and you say nah, 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 nah. all right but there'll be a day you will not be able to deny your unfaithfulness and that day he's going to say look up here listen to this that i i believe this is going to happen what were you thinking What were you thinking? Well, the stars weren't aligned, Papa Father. 
The situation wasn't just right. Things were out of kilter in my life and in the church and other things and the leadership. It just wasn't. Things just weren't exactly the way I wanted them to be. What do you think he's going to say to that? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. You think he's going to say that? Listen, I don't want to take so lightly what I'm saying to you that you take it too lightly either. Let me just say this. Your God, in the form of Jesus Christ, never took a break. Even when he was taking a break. When he would go off to the desert, who was with him? His disciples. He was evangelizing. He was discipling. When they'd come and he was taking a rest, he'd feed them. You see, you, you, oftentimes we question, what is epic? Epic is us by Christ's power saying, God, I am at your full disposition. Amen. I will evangelize. I will preach. I will intercede. And I will communicate with others in the biblical command. I am determined to do your work. You know, there's a song like that. I am determined to be invincible till he has finished his... Do you know it? Because I forgot it. Till he has finished his... I can't remember the next word. I know it's his work. I know it's his plan, but there's a word that they use there that fits. Till he has finished his in me. Yeah, it's probably his work to some degree. But the point is, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to stop. You know, when the Word of God tells us that he is the power that gives us that invincibility, and as you sing that first song that we sung, nothing ever can, nothing ever will, his goal is to use you as a tool. Now, here's the thing. You can step aside and his work will still go forward. But you will lose your reward. How many of y'all ready to lose our rewards? You're doing it by stepping aside, letting others take your job, not using your gifts, not doing it constantly, not being a part of that. You know, today, I got a hold of Betty Ann this morning at breakfast. Where are you at, sweetheart? Right here. Her brother has been on his back for a year. He got saved two years ago, correct? And uh, the Lord allowed him then to be bedridden after that. In fact, he just had surgery on a bed sore that very difficult to go through. But men like that aren't allowed to do what you should be. I know this, and I've watched it happen over and over again. If you have gifts that you've decided to cloister and not to exercise, he will take your possibilities away. And if that's what you want, I don't know that you do. I don't know that that's what I want. Man, certainly we don't, do we? Authenticity as a church starts with us doing the work. I'm going to go through in April in four sections. Number one, how do I adopt a ministry mindset that includes having Christ first and foremost? Second, how do I create opportunities, myself and for others? Number three, three how do I cultivate a ministry ladder in my mind? Because I'm telling you, if we have decided that I've gone here and I don't really need to go any further, there's a problem, right? And then number four, we ought to celebrate the local church. You know that? We ought to celebrate the local church. We ought to show our community that when others have stopped going to church, that they're sick and tired of what they think is wrong in the church, that you and I ought to celebrate the local church and reproduce servant believers. Amen. People who really want to do right. 
People who really want to serve. And you know how that's going to happen? By sitting around and doing nothing, right? So I wonder, does anyone watch you doing nothing? Does anyone watch me doing nothing? Let me ask you, do they? Yeah. So are you going to be held accountable for that? Yep, you will. Is it worth it to you to be stubborn about it? I hope not. Look at Amos chapter 3 and verse 3, won't you? I want you to think about three situations, and then we'll be done. Amos chapter 3, we're going to do the second half of this message tonight, but we feel lost in a world of religion sometimes. We're disoriented, and we can find, regain, we can get a hold of an authentic identity in the local church very easily. But Amos 3 and verse 3 says this, Amos 3 and verse 3, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Oh, what does that mean? Well, you look at verse 4 for just a second. Think for a moment. Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he have taken nothing? There are certain things that are out of whack in nature. And there are certain things that are out of whack in religion. Okay, here it is. You ready? The one letter that changed an entire segment of our society. One letter. A. Just the letter A. See, Pastor, what do you mean? Look at John 1.1, 1, 1, won't you? John chapter 1 and verse 1 said, In the beginning was the Word. Yes. Who is that? Jesus. How do you know? Verse 14. If you look at verse 14, the Word of God tells us, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You go back to John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Word was a God. Oh, it doesn't say that. Wait a minute. Let me see. What is that? God. He was God. The Word was God. I suppose the question is, does He continue to be God? Yes. Revelation chapter 1 tells us He's going to be the one that actually at the end unfurls. He's the one. The Word of God says, who's worthy to open the book? Yes. Who is worthy to open the book? Jesus, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He's the only one. In the beginning was the Word, Jesus Christ, and the Word, capital W, there's His name, was with God, and the Word was God. Genesis 1.26 said in the beginning, they're talking about men. He says, let us make man in our image. Yes. Not talking to the angels. So God created man in his own image, verse 27. You say, well, that right there is indefinite proof of the Trinity. I know that. But the Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that. Do you know why? One letter. What is that letter? <sighs> Their originators grabbed a hold of the Bible and chopped it up into tiny pieces and spit it out in a completely different form. That form is called the New World Translation. Please don't look it up. Don't even look at it. There's no need to. Say, Pastor, you're telling me not to look this up? Eh, you know, go with the authentic. What do you need to look into junk for? Just go with the authentic. You know the truth. You're going to see stuff like this all the time. You're going to see it in the Mormon religion. Say, Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this phrase from the Mormon Bible. The, fr the phrase is this. Jesus is the law. Wait, wait a minute. I, I understood from my Bible <laughs> that Jesus Christ said, I won't change the law. I won't move it from one jot or one tittle. I won't Make the law to be this or that. But I, you know what I know about Jesus? He's the new covenant. And in His blood, which is what we're about to do in just a moment, is to take the Lord's Supper. It's not actual blood. It's not actual flesh. But we're going to take the Lord's Supper here in a minute. The Word of God tells us that Jesus Christ said, I came not to change the law. 
I came not to, the word is avargar, to change the law. And he differentiates himself from the law. You know, Jesus Christ was the active word, whereas the law is the written word. And there is a difference. I don't worship my Bible. I love the Bible. It's accurate in every way. It's perfect in every way. Who do I worship? Does he have any rival? No. I'm grateful for his tool. But this is a tool, is it not? This is the tool. In fact, it's the only. Understand, this is what Baptists believe. This right here is the only word of God. Genesis to Revelation. It has been proven time and time again with all of the texts, with all of the manuscripts, 5,600 manuscripts, proven. But the Mormon will tell you Jesus is the law. In fact, the Book of Mormon says it textually. It's regurgitated in the chosen. Yep. In fact, a lot of things are regurgitated in the chosen. Jesus actually in the chosen, in that scene where he's standing in front of the people, instead of saying what the Word of God says, he says, he says, I am the law. In the videos, the chosen. And they say that the Mormons haven't influenced that. I'm telling you, LDS is all over the chosen. Be careful. All right? And that's not just, you say, you're just finding one. Okay, man, I can give you a list of 170 different things that that, why? You say, Pastor, what are you saying? Look up here. Listen, I'll tell you what I'm saying. 99.5% of rat poison is Satan doesn't simply sidestep the Word of God. With Jesus Christ, He quoted the Bible accurately, perfectly, but with a little bit different... Right? Let's go on for just a second to some Orthodox religions. There's some Orthodox religions out there, and just recently, it was... Sad, but there was a post that was made and was actually publicized by this major Orthodox group. And it had Jesus Christ with his elbows up like this, and he was laying down. And uh, he had the lower half of his body was a sirloin steak. I I'm sorry. Can I tell you this, my friends? Jesus Christ, when he said, I am a rock, he wasn't a literal rock. When he said, I am water, he wasn't some kind of river somewhere. And when he said, eat my body, he didn't mean to be a cannibal. But that is what people believe. They actually literally believe that what we're about to do here, that that grape juice transforms into his blood before you eat it. And that f bread transforms into literal meat. And they put that out to say, here's the figurative idea. Jesus is a sirloin steak. Now, my friends, let me ask you a question. If Jesus said it, is it true? Can it be taken out of context? Oh, my goodness, yes. It can be taken out of context. You see? So... If it's produced, can I just say this? If something is produced by a cult, maybe they might influence it a little bit. You know? The New World Translation is produced by who? The JWs. Is it accurate? No. The Chosen is being produced and worked through with the LDS community in what is called VidAngel. And they're trying to cooperate. This is nuts. They're trying to cooperate with Christian quote unquote brothers. As a matter of fact, we were just watching a video this morning with our staff where Dallas Jenkins, who's the actual director of all of this, said, My Mormon brothers and sisters are so much closer to me than I realize. They're exactly like me, they worship the same Jesus. This was his statement. Is that true? 
What does it do? It produces 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Who is the author of confusion? Young Christians get confused by these cooperative efforts of cults and people who call themselves evangelical Christians. And what happens? They get off. They get confused. They become hurt. Is it wise to do that? So whether it's orthodoxy, whether it's the Mormon cult, or whether it's the Jehovah's Witness cult, you do realize Mormons believe that all of us will populate our own world. Each of us will be a god. We do get that, right? You do understand they were thinking of the first Adam as a little god. That you and I are gods. That we will, you can look up the God Makers, the book The God Makers, and it will show you that. You say, Pastor, I thought we weren't going to study this stuff. We just have to study the authentic. Let's do that now. The Word of God tells us in John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. You know how He did that? Without works. You know how He did that? Without me putting in half of my salvation. I don't. Who is the Savior of the world? Is He 100% Savior? Or just 50%? Do I do works to get to heaven? Not according to the Bible. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. How do I help you to authentically find your identity? Well, maybe you don't have one yet. You see, if you're calling yourself a Christian, but you haven't received Jesus Christ, who is the only full-time, complete Savior of the world, perhaps you haven't any knowledge at all enough to come to Him. It just simply, it's very simple. And the same with me. It's the same with me. There was a day and time I had to accept the fact that I'm a sinner. I had to put my full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I had to renounce everything me. I had to renounce my sin. And let him save me. That's not Mormon. Mormon is, you're a God. You've got a flicker in you of divinity. You're just fine. You just need to cooperate with the Lord. And and somehow you'll get there. Because you'll do some works and you'll get there. My friend, Jesus Christ, if he's not all Savior, is none Savior. If he didn't save me to the uttermost. If he didn't bleed his blood all over the place and die on that cross for me. If he didn't... If I don't trust Him alone, Jeffrey, if I don't trust Him alone, David, if I'm not trusting Him alone, I have fallen in to the trap of assimilation of all these religions who teach you a certain way to get to heaven through works-based theology. Say, Pastor, they're all over the place. I agree with you. I agree. But can I just tell you this, my friends? Jesus Christ is not all over the place. He's right in here. This book teaches you about Him. No, this book is not Him. But this book, He fulfilled completely. That was the word He used. He fulfilled the law. He came to completely clarify the law. He came to make certain that we were, like, what do you say, readjusted. Because... Everybody got it so wrong. So wrong. The Pharisees during that time were doing what the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and these Orthodox religions and these groups all over the place are doing. And you'd be shocked if I started to go through the list of Orthodoxy. It's incredible. They're so false, every single one of them. And Jesus says this, real simply. Hey, hey, come here. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I will save your soul. I will change the world. I, by my blood, by my sacrifice, by my resurrection, will win you unto myself. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and just think for a moment, where are you at in this vast religious pool 
Do you feel lost in the world of religion? Disoriented? How can you regain your authentic identity as a local church, as part of the local church, as a member of the body? Hey, adopt the ministry mindset Christ did. Have Him, not anything else. Create opportunity. Cultivate a ministry ladder. Celebrate the local church. Jehovah's Witnesses can't celebrate because they're busy working their way to heaven. Mormons do the same. Say, I, I had somebody the other day tell me this. They said, Pastor, I don't like it when you talk about other religions. Did you care that Jesus did? Does it bother you that the apostles did? Paul spoke of false religion. Peter spoke of false religion. Pointed it out and showed it. Back then it was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. Back then it was a whole group of religions that they went after. They said, don't focus on, don't listen to this. All works based. This is false theology. Galatians chapter 5, 1 says, Stand in the liberty wherewith thou hast been made free. Do not entangle yourself again with the affairs of this life and religion and nonsense. And My friends, listen. If you are religiously trying to get to the Lord, then you won't work. You'll come and sit. If you're pious and proud of yourself and lifting yourself up, it will stymie the vitality and involvement. Because no longer do you love Him enough to do that. You just want to look real good and be religious. So the question is, Christian, are you stymieing your involvement by religiosity? And non-Christian, isn't it time to really give your heart to Christ, honestly? Is there someone here to say, Pastor, I'm just not sure 